in three, a two, a one, and go. Let's try this out. Are we live? Can you see me? All right, I think you can. All right, good. Hi there. Look at that. There's the absolute finger. Welcome, everybody, to Wine Shark Wednesday. It is I, your host, the Wine Shark. We have entered the sweating season here in Texas. It is that time of year comes around when, well, crap gets hot. And so that, the reason, I, I thought of this the other day, by the way, why is it that when first we meet, I usually tell you about the way things were going. So yeah, anyway, the, the reason things are going, especially on the weather, because those decisions have a lot of effect on, say, what I'm drinking um, and the thoughts we have. So we're moving into that summer season. And, um, it is beginning to get hot, so we're going to be focusing on wines, generally speaking, that are good for your summer purposes. Because I assume you're drinking now and not six months in the past. So, welcome to John and Angela and Miss Donna. Hello to everybody. Well, I'm glad we can see me, and there was a whole thing, and the streaming, and a, who knew? Singing my streaming song. So, all right. Well, I hope everybody's doing well. We are doing great here as well. Uh, we've had uh, a lot of stuff going on. Uh, on the back of the house, but nothing noteworthy yet. All stuff in progress. Today, though, we're going to talk about the virtues, five quick facts that you should know about canned wine. Although I looked at the image from the thumbnail and thought, and thought about five canned wine facts, and I'm like, I'm not just going to read you five random wine facts from somewhere. I mean, these are facts about wine that comes in cans. Okay, so to be clear in my language, sometimes it's not my first. Sometimes you gotta have a take two. So let's talk about cans. Um, we are trying today, by the way, the essentially geared, yeah, loving the canned wine because this is again a concept of heat and poolside, and not only that, we're gonna get some rosé wine, and it's gonna be great. So let's talk uh, first about the can, the five facts. We're gonna name them off. So the first cool wine fact you should know is about is about the one thing that probably comes to mind first, and that is recyclability. When we think about aluminum cans rather than glass bottles, um, we think about both of those things as being recyclable. However, cans have a lot of advantages in practical application. In order to be good at recycling or to have a recycling benefit, stuff actually has to get into the recycling chain and the recycling chain has to work through its whole cycle. Right? You need to get things back in, in reuse and then into new products as reclaimed materials. Aluminum is far and away better at this uh, than glass. So while glass has been traditional for hundreds of years, as far as wine is concerned, aluminum has a much better rate of being put into recycling by the users. And usually when you have a quote unquote new can, uh, sometimes up to 70% of that material is reclaimed. Aluminum and the Aluminum Association is very good about touting this as one of their features uh, as far as the using cans is concerned. So remember, when it comes to recyc true recyclability, cans are much, much better at this than, and therefore better for the environment in that recycling uh, aspect than their bottle-laden brethren. All right, fact number two, weight. Uh, well, this might seem intuitive, the idea that a single can is lighter than a bottle. Uh, by volume, uh, it takes about two of these 12-ounce cans equal to a bottle. Um, three aluminum cans, if they're the smaller, for, the smaller narrow format. Um, but these aluminum cans basically have about, I think it's, it's something like there's, there's of the overall, if you talk about the volume per weight, the, the volume of wine you get, for the weight of packaging you get is significantly less. This is good for a number of reasons. Number one, simply a matter of for what you're carrying around, you're carrying on less weight and packaging. That means it's cheaper to ship. And that cost has a nice effect on your final price tag. Some, if not, you know, it's actually not some, not all. Uh, a good portion of your final cost of a wine when you receive it is based on how much money it took to get to you. So putting it on the truck, shipping it to you, all the shipping and handling things that go along with it are very important. Um, so, and, and, are, and are costly. Not only that, because glass is more fragile than aluminum, 
uh, the bottles take up more space, the, the, the cans can take up a better cubic volume, yada, yada, yada. Cans are just more efficient at getting the wine to you. Very similar to what we talked about, we talked about box wines. So it's environmentally friendly, it saves fuel costs, it, overall it has a much less carbon footprint. But even if you are a, an imbecile who doesn't think that, that the environment needs our help, you still have to admit that your pocketbook needs some help. And therefore, if you're not paying for it, it benefits you. So think about weight as simply a cost savings when it comes to that. All right, fact number three, taste. Uh, one of the things that is considered a detriment uh, in the concept of canned wines, and this has gone on in the beer world for years as well, and that is what's the difference between, you know, it tastes better versus from a bottle versus from a can. Well, those ideas are kind of founded in some old school thinking. Modern aluminum cans with their chemically applied liners are 100% the same level of quality as any bottle or any boxed slash bagged wine. The product that comes out of them is high quality so long as it, is, it has been stored correctly. So, when, and, and of course, we're not talking about the quality level of what you put in it, but obviously if you put good quality product in, in the first place, that which is going to come out of it is going to be just as good as anything else. So cans have don't have they don't have an aftertaste. They don't have some sort of residual lingering anything. It is simply a myth. Okay, so get over that. Don't don't perpetuate that myth. Um, the, by the way, the myth hails from, if I recall from the beer world correctly, a long time ago. Land, you know, and we're talking about 80, 60, 80 years. We used to have, you know, when cans were first coming in as a popular format, that you didn't have the ability to put the, the spray past the plastic liners inside them. So therefore the metal was actually in contact with the beverage. That is no longer the case. Inside this of this aluminum can is not the same as the outside. So it doesn't have the same, uh, and you're not getting in contact with the metal. So it doesn't change anything. All right, so that's fact three. Uh, fact number four, flexibility. Um, this is, Kind of goes to the idea that cans go places that bottles cannot and should not go. Um, poolside, outdoor events and activities, camping, uh, lots of things uh, are, uh, there's a lot of advantages to this style of format. Uh, not only is, is it an issue of breakability, you don't want to bring, for instance, I grew up in a town where Floating on the river and hanging out in, in inner tubes was a very popular pastime and activity. Massive campaigns and huge awareness. You don't bring glass on the river. Well, guess what? That meant wine was pretty much out of the thing. Now, obviously, hot days in wine, you still might enjoy a nice little rosé on, uh, on your little float. So therefore, cans are good for that. Next to your pool, or even just from a matter of compact natures. Um, camping and outdoor activities, what's great about cans is they are compacted for volume, as I said before, but also you can crush the cans down and there's much less trash to haul back out or there's much less trash for you to throw away uh, at the end of your event. So they're good for that. Um, it's also easier to control the temperature on a can. Uh, believe it or not, you know, glass, because of the thickness of glass, while it retains uh, cold temperatures better, it is easier to get a can cold chilled down fast or even just to keep it at the correct temperature. So that means the wine that you get is going to be served at the right, correct temperature so long as you are doing the work on the back end. A simple block of, uh, you know, blue ice or whatever, your, your method of chosen chilling in your, in your cooler will keep your wine at the perfect temperature. And all you have to do is run out and pop a can. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, this, is a, this is kind of a, a remember asterisk and not, a, not necessarily a pro in the cans column, but that is, what is it fit for? Um, while cans are great for a lot of things, not every type of wine is suited well for cans. Um, number one, I mean, you can't, for instance, as an example, you can't just take a regular straight up sparkling wine and stick it in a can and sell it on the, on the shelves. You have to be, you have to formulate what you're putting in for the can. Um, still wines obviously are a little bit different. Uh, generally speaking, you're, I don't think that they have to do much in the way of modification. But remember the differences uh, in how a bottle works, especially if it's a bottle with a cork in it. Obviously, wines that are packaged in cans are designed to be consumed now. They're now wines. They're very, they're very present. They're buy it and drink it. You know, we're not going to be sitting on our cellars hanging out onto, I've got a six pack of the 1993 Chateauneuf de Pepe. Yeah, not going to happen. Uh, so why this the, the format is very, very much designed at 
only one segment of your wine world. It's not to say that cans are the, you know, the silver bullet for all things. Um, oh, also remember one of the things that they're fit for that we talked about last week. Remember how we talked about light strike, right? That's another thing that you don't have to worry about with cans. Cans don't suffer from light strike. This, by the way, in the beer world is critically important because in the beer world, light strike happens so fast uh, that, that, they, that cans have become more popular because they're 100% immune to it. But anyway, so yeah, recyclability, weight, taste, flexibility, and fit. Five important things you should remember. The whole point of really of this is get on board with canned wine programs. Find the white canned wines you like. Don't be afraid to approach them. Um, another important part thing that I saw that's a feature, not a bug, is also um, serving size. Wine cans come anywhere. I mean, the average can, like I'm drinking right now, which is a 12 fluid ounce can, is effectively half a bottle. But you've got some of these that are basically four pack cans. So you've got much more control over how much wine you're opening at any given time. So you don't have to open 750 milliliters at a time. So it's not quite as dial a yield as you get from a box wine but it's still a lot of control where you don't have to open up a whole bottle if you just want a glass or two with dinner canned wines are a great solution too so there's a bonus sixth feature all right um any questions from anybody so far everybody's being pretty quiet because well pretty sure it's just me rambling along let me let you know you're there so weird anyway all right let's talk about the wine quiz it's time for the wine quiz Pull off the sheet here. Da, 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 da. This is our little wine wars wine quiz that we've been doing for a couple of uh, months now. Oh, yeah. Kind of a fun thing. Basically, I stumped the chump with yours truly. It's uh, there are five categories, very similar to uh, Trivial Pursuit. It has Vine Divino, which is about growing grapes, making wine, and world production of grapes. The Grapesphere, which is about grape varieties, the wines that they make, and their geography. Wine Cellar, which is selecting, storing, or tasting wine. Wine and food, my personal favorite, of course. Cooking with food, with wine, food, wine pairing, and wine service. And then lastly, cork culture. Wine people, business, arts, sciences, and trivia. So those are the five categories we're going to do. We'll see how best we do out of five this week. Hopefully there are not a lot of true-false ones. Those are always ones that seem to trip us up. Uh, John asked a question about what about like their carbonated cans? Um, oh, you can absolutely have sparkling wine in cans. My point was... You don't just take the exact same uh, methods that you would do for bottling and apply it to cans. There's some there's some science to what how you get the the wine sparkling in here. In other words, there's a lot more Charmat method magic um, when it comes to this. Uh, that was actually one of the features that I read when Sophie Coppola of Francis Ford Coppola fame, his daughter, did a spinoff line um, very much targeted at a young club drinking market and they had these i think it was called sophie and it was these little narrow cans the red bull style um so i think they were probably what maybe five and a half ounce cans six ounce cans of the, their sparkling wine and they were pink and bright and bubbly and then they had their they had a they even had a flexi bendy straw strapped to the side really targeted at like club use and such and they were commenting about how they had to reformulate and make sure that they were doing the wine they couldn't just take the same wine they were making put it in a can and go that change it but the follow-up question was carbonated not cardboard yes i assumed carbonated cardboard cans would be really cool too because that would be i mean there's obviously that's the, the micro box format i didn't think that's what you meant so good question john all right what do we got here what does the addition of sulfur dioxide prevent in crushed white grape juice? Ooh, sulfites question right off the bat. What does the addition of sulfur dioxide prevent in crushed white grape juice? Wine technical question. I'm going to say it controls volatile acetic acid, VA. Oh, browning or oxidization? Oh, wrong for me. Uh, so that was the browning or oxidization. You add sulfur dioxide to prevent it from oxidizing. Sulfur, sulfur and sulfite products are usually used to control VA in wine's production overall. So I'm going to defer to them though. They are eh, wrong one for me. All right, second question. Vine to vino, right? No, is that right? No, Grapesphere. True or false, outside France, the spelling of semillon often loses the accent over the E. Well, yeah, every place out of every place loses accents over I mean, 
we misspell stuff a lot. Yeah, the answer is true. I mean, that's that's a spelling question, not a wine question. Unfortunately, I'm afraid, people, that we, we it's very difficult to, because, you know, even with keyboards and the digital world, it is what it is. I have to go and, when I'm typing formally, I will often actually go use the appropriate insert special character. But like when I posted the, 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 the title of the video today, I'm usually lazy. I just go, I Google the word rosé, it knows what I mean, I copy, I paste, I put it in there. I'm sure it's like Alt 243 or something like that. But Anyway, keyboard warrior. All right, next question. True or false? Germany's wine classification system divides QMP, which by the way stands for Qualitative Mit Predicate, or which it doesn't say that on the card by the way, or top quality wines into six styles based on the ripeness level of their grapes. That is true. Uh, that is the... Actually, hang on. Six styles based on ripeness. Okay, yes. I wanted to make sure they weren't associating quality with the list. But QMP wines, or wines that are rated Qualität mit Predicate, are listed in the levels of ripeness. These include Cabinet, Auslese, Spätlese, Trockenbeeren Auslese, oh sorry, Beeren Auslese, Trockenbeeren Auslese, and Eiswein. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is true, ranging from Cabinet to Trockenbeeren Auslese. So hooray for me, and yes, I've got you, Germany. You're my man. All right, what, this is the next question is, what corkscrew, sometimes called an ASO, by the way, that is spelled A-H-S-O, right? Ah, so, uh, ASO is good choice for removing fragile corks or taking a nip of wine from the bottle undetected. I'm sorry. It says what corkscrew is sometimes called an also. I'm like, isn't the answer an also? Because that's what I would say it would be. Um, hmm. I I don't know. I don't know another name for this. I'm going to get this wrong. But it, the, by the way, the also is good for what they describe. It's good for removing fragile corks because what the also does. I've got a cork here for an example. It has a pair of, of, of forks that are kind of like your fingers. They're actually one slightly longer than the other. You lead with this one, and then you wedge it in between the bottle and the cork, and it pulls it out just like that. It uses uh, friction, and therefore it doesn't violate the cork with a corkscrew. Okay? So that's why, by the way, the actual the name of what corkscrew, I'm like, it's not a corkscrew. It's a cork removal device. But anyway, they say it's called the butler's friend. This two-pronged device doesn't pierce the cork, allowing the butler to imbibe or replace with inferior wine and recork. Also, I don't that's that's an interesting legend. I have never actually heard that your butler is thieving your good wine by, well, wedging a tiny piece of metal underneath it and pouring it out. Yeah, that's uh Wow, you got you gotta hire better staff down, Nabby. Anyway, uh next up. So let's see. Oh, I said we're two for two here. So this is like this is tiebreaker here. What folding pocket cargo carried by restaurant waitstaff did Karl Weinecke invent in 1882? What folding pocket cargo? Some people call it the waiter's friend. I've always called it a wine flat. That's what I've been heard of. But basically the, the waiter's corkscrew. Yeah, the waiter's corkscrew, a waiter's friend. Um, by the way, championed, and I don't, I mean, I would like to see whether... Carl Weinecke has anything to do with the particular area of France, and that is um, Langiole. They are they specialize in corkscrews. Funny thing, I happen to have one right here, uh, which which have a couple of features. Uh, number one, they were the they were actually pocket knives first, that then a corkscrew was attached. Okay, so this is the example of the waiter's friend that they were just talking about. But uh, to, to give a point, they were actually, they started off as a folding pocket knife that happened to have a corkscrew attached, no lever. You simply use this and the brute manly force of your French steel to pull the cork out accordingly. Uh, later adding this, maybe that's what Weinecke it was, uh, was a part of. But the cool point, but the cool fun thing, the way that you always know that you have a genuine langue, other than the fact that they'll tell you, is the fact that they have, their symbol is a B. See if they'll we'll get focus on this, but I have to wait to see if it actually focuses. But there's a little honeybee that is right there that is cast into the uh, that's cast into the the back of the knife. So that's how you know how you have a genuine langoulet. 
Yeah, there you can see them. Okay, good. All right. Angela said, do you pour your canned wine into a glass or do you drink straight out of the can? Funny you should ask, Angela. That was Thank you for going to Segway School with yours truly, the wine shark. I was about to say, uh, this, by the way, is a transport vessel. Just like you don't drink your, bottle, your, your wine out of the bottle, you don't drink it out of this either. This, by the way, also applies to your beer world. As Seamus slash Bob will tell you too, act like a damn human and put your wines and your beer in a glass. Doesn't matter whether it comes in a bottle or a can, we use glassware for specific purposes. Remember, this is a tool, just like everything else. This is a storage device, this is a tool. The storage device is fine, but we pour it in the glass so that we can actually serve it. That way we get all of our aroma capture, blah, 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 taste events, things like that. Great question, Angela. Now, of course, if you're sitting poolside, drink it out of the can because that, I, I'm not suggesting you bring your crystal down to the pool or the river. However, if you're at home, this is the part where exercise your good manners. I mean, you can eat ice cream straight out of the tub too. That's okay. But not in front of other people. Okay? So, all right. Now that we've got that out of the way, I love it. It was a brilliant setup for the grocery store grab. The grocery store grab is, for those of you that are not familiar, because I always say that, uh, all of you, I'm pretty sure that all, like, 10 of you that come to see me are, are actually familiar with the grocery store grab. But, hey, we love the new people. The grocery store grab, the premise is to get the best value per dollar out of wine that we buy at non-big box stores and non-specialty stores, specifically places like the grocery store. If you happen to shop via convenience or necessity at a grocery store, you may be in a place where you don't have expert advice easily available. Therefore, we have to rely on labeling to understand what's in the bottle. And we want to reward wines that tell us with common language where the wine is from, what it's made from, and what flavors we should expect out of, the, out of that. This time, by the way, we, of course, used a can. Um, I don't know why I'm going to bother to show you the can here, especially when I've got an image of Essentially Geared Wine Company, a rosé wine from California. So this caught my eye um, also for, for a couple of reasons. One, I just like their cool little kind of geo logo there. Um, but also, the, the price point on this wine was really good. One of the things that wine in a can is having a challenge to and that is one single can is of a 12 ounce can of this format is equal to half a bottle. Therefore, most people don't associate the, the price point being half a bottle. And when somebody sees a single 12 ounce can of something that costs 10 or $12, they're not equating that to being a $20 bottle of wine. So what I'm finding is that the canned market is still very firmly in the grasp of the value line, this wine included. Uh, this essentially geared came in at two, three dollars and twenty nine cents. So this is basically a seven dollar bottle of wine. Okay, that's the quality level we should be expecting here. But you know, obviously you see the front art, but on the back they've got some great graphic design with some very important in, uh, information on it. Um, number one, it says pair with pizza by the slice, barbecue brisket and falafel. Bam! Instant wine and accurate and more importantly detailed examples of what you should pair with, which is great. It's got a very big 12% ABV. It says, think pink Starburst plus 80s punk rock. That, if I, as a wine description, is fun, if not, if not informative, because pink Starburst is a flavor. It says, seek the everyday uncommon. Every journey is an opportunity for a unique experience, along with ours, oh, along ours, whether it's sourcing grapes from our favorite growers to how we package our final product, we always seek the uncommon. Is crafted by real people and then it says cans don't break try it corkscrew screw corks and two glass two cans equals one bottle great wine practically packaged crafted to keep up with your everyday adventures so they're obviously aiming at a very mobile kind of crowd not only i think with their um sustainability slash uh what's the word i'm looking for the um their sustainability and their graphic design right they're, they they've got that outwardly go out, go adventure outdoor market. Because I think cans are well, by the way, do, will do well to continue to focus on that. The, the, the which was basically my, my fourth point. Flexibility is probably their biggest strength. The idea that they can go places glass can't is the best way for them to lead off. So, and uh, John said, by the way, that's what plastic glasses are for. Yes, for poolside and other use, that's exactly what plastic glasses are for, but still, Ice cream out of the tub, I'm just saying. All right, um, so let's talk about this wine a little bit. Let's see what we got going on here. Like I said, 
Uh, it doesn't tell us anything about what variety of grape it is. It's just rosé wine. That is a big negative in there, in my in my opinion. Remember that rosé is a style. It's not one thing. So they should tell me it's made from grapes X, Y, and Z. So it told me where it's from and told me what style it was, but it didn't tell me grapes. So that loses a whole grape. You can't make an A for that. Um, it's got flavor words, sort of. The pink Starburst and Pays Punk Rock is cute, but not quite as, as, uh, as detailed as I'd like. Just a couple more descriptors. You know, tell me what sort of red fruits and pink grapefruit, et cetera. Give me a little bit of wording. And then specific pairings. Now, they get a bonus point. They get a, they get a B plus here. Um, and I would actually go maybe break this as a, as, a, as a solid B for them not being specific with flavors. But pairing with pizza by the slice, barbecue brisket, and falafel, hey, those are some very, very specific things, which I think is excellent advice for the new wine drinker. So um, this, let's go ahead and give it a go. Um, the color on this, by the way, from a rosé perspective, definitely gives me the belief that this is uh, either Cab Sauv or some other darker skinned grape. It is a, uh, it's a very, what's the word I'm looking for here? It's not quite tangerine orange, but it's close. It's, it's, it's very much not in the pink rosé line. It is much more towards tangerine and orange line. That usually tends to be for darker skin grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc and um, as opposed to redder grapes like Zinfandel, things like that. So, Although remember, the length of time they macerate can have a lot of effect on that too. So, uh, swirling around the glass on the nose. Okay, this is red fruits. I mean, I would expect that from Rosé, but also there's a... There's a funky, not funky, that's not the right word. What I mean is a, I'm surprised to find it here smell. And it's not pink grapefruit. And it's almost like a, almost, almost like a mango. Or no, 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 it is not mango because I always get this confused. This is more papaya. There's a, a, a heady tropical fruit smell. But mostly I get like strawberry and maybe a little bit of uh, bright cherry. Angela said we just talked about orange wine at fair. Okay, orange wine though is a different thing, Angela. Orange wine is extended skin contact white, white, white grapes. So that's a style. So orange wine and rosé are separate styles. This color, while orange, is a rosé style wine. That can be confusing, I totally understand. Um, but yeah, we in fact, actually, I, although you never are going to find it at the grocery store, I'll probably, I need to reach out and do it, do a, a, a little blurb on orange wine so people understand what it is. It actually had a, it had a whole fad a couple of years ago. Maybe you want to say three to five. Um, that and blue wine, the two colored, uh, colored weird wine expansions. Anyway, I answer more questions in a minute. But yeah, so this red fruits, that strange thing of, of papaya, like I said, I wouldn't expect tropical fruits out of this wine, but there you go. But, um, yeah, all right, let's see where it goes. Yeah, okay. We've got, the, the strawberries don't have that fresh or unripe strawberry thing that you get out of uh, other rosés, or like Provence-style rosés. This is almost more like, um, like the, it's, it's, it's muted. I want to say it's almost like a fresh cherry tomato. If that's gonna be, that's gonna be an off uh, an off flavor for most people, I'm like, yeah, tastes like bright cherry tomatoes. Tastes like tastes like papaya. It's got um, an, a, a sense of savory to it that is the and the acids are very middle toned, right? It doesn't have that bright spark that you get out of a lot of other rosés. It is acid wines. It's like down, uh, but man, wow, that's that is interesting. It is. It's easily approachable, and again, very, very quaffable. It doesn't attack your mouth a lot. The acids are medium at best. So unlike its other rosé uh, other rosé styles, this is very moderate in the, in the acid department. Yeah. Now, here's another one that I kind of wonder about in the wine world. And that is, when it comes to, wine, to beer in cans, we have to worry about dates, right? Because... 
wine's lifespan and beer's lifespan are very different. One of the things you don't see on here, of course, is a when it was made. So I also wonder about whether wine, whether wine in cans, you know, what's their durability and what's their lifespan, and are we making sure that these have uh, an appropriate uh, shelf life? Um, not that this one I think is flawed. I just think that the style of wine, I think the style of grapes they put in here is much more robust. Which, by the way, now to call on that more robust flavor, that more cherry tomato, papaya kind of line, the idea of this with pizza, I think, is a nice compliment because the acids in the tomato and the tomato sauce are going to make this wine pop a little bit and kind of balance it. But this would be wonderful and delightful with mozzarella cheese and a little hint of pepperoni or an Italian sausage and fennel or even just a margarita style pizza. If you go with white pizza, it'd be great there too with olive oil and bas basil, 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 depending on whether you're English or not. Um, yeah, very, this could be a lot of fun with a lot of types of pizza because, you know, pizza by the slice is a, is a descriptor of service, not a descriptor of actual types of pizza. You know, you notice that? Barbecue brisket, we can probably range range that in, and falafels, of course, are fried awesome. So, the uh, the the herbs and spices, I think, in all of those would work really well with this wine. So, uh, we usually don't. I said basically, is this wine well executed? I would say yeah. Um, this is again, it has a. It is not built the same way some other rosés are. So, if you're a rosé all day fan right now, this one might take you for a little bit of a loop. Um, is it on style? Well, it. It's a California rosé. It's a pretty broad style, but I would say sort of. This is always a hard question to answer. You see, because it's not a. I don't think it's a black or white issue. I think this is close to that style, but it is different enough to be remarkable. Um, is it worth the price tag? Oh man, for seven bucks, you know, for a for a bottle or three three bucks a can, not a bad plan at all. Um, definitely a fun quaffable drink i would be uh definitely enjoy it with all of those foods and now i'm going to think about having to order a pizza to finish up my wine so that sounds like a great plan thank you for the suggestion essentially geared all right yes frick winery as opposed to just a to being my spirit animal who is uh ellen shellstrop in the in the wonderful series um the good place. You're not just cursing at me, John. You're talking about an actual winery called Frick. Yeah, orange wine was an interesting little fad. It was, and again, I say that it's been around forever, but you know, it's one of those wine trends that kind of somebody, some influencer, famous person became aware, and and or some marketer at, at a distributor and said, "Yeah, orange wine. We'll tell, we'll sell them that now." Orange wine is a niche. It is, I have found that it is not, it is something that's for wine lovers, not for the average bear. Because from a white wine perspective, it's got a lot more flavor complexity, and but it's also got a lot more flavor compounds and sourness that white wine drinkers aren't used to. And I mean sourness not in the same bright acid way, I mean more of a mouth complexity it's almost more like sour beers which again aren't sour beers are popular right now but they're also not the everyday beer drinkers expectation of what beer is orange wine is the same kind of thing it is neither rosé nor white wine and it has characteristics of both but it is not some happy venn diagram middle it's sort of like david s pumpkins it's its own thing but yeah, I'll look to uh, see if I can find a bottle, and we'll do that. Maybe we'll do a dual one where we do uh, orange wine plus blue wine. And then we have, I don't know, brown wine? Can you mix those two colors together? Anyway, uh, any other questions before I sign off and let you guys free to your evening? More comments? Rash political statements. Okay. Well, I hope you guys are enjoying everything. Um, we've got Wines of France coming up next week at the Scarborough Renaissance Festival. We are looking into the summer to booking a lot of private tastings and still trying to get some local wine events going. Um, after our awesome run at the Tower last year, I'm trying to find some place we can do private tasting or public, rather, tastings hosted in the DFW area. 
preferably aligned with some sort of food joint. So I've been looking into a couple of places. Um, event spaces, unfortunately, uh, because it is their business to rent events, uh, aren't necessarily economically viable. I'd have to pass along a cost to you, and I don't want to do that. Um, so I'm hoping that some, some restaurant partners will start, uh, well, they will sign on the line, which is dotted, to quote Alex Baldwin from Ben Gary Glenn Ross. So uh, anyway, we'll see about those. I hope to see you guys there. But uh, if you like what we're doing, uh, like and hit that subscribe button and share with a wine-loving friend. Uh, then if you really like what you're doing, join us over on Patreon. Support me, support the channel. It's great. I'm still trying to figure out about additional content stuff there. We've been having a crisis of both time and conscience. So I'm trying to find some cool value for Patreon and reassessing after the last two years about what Patreon really is for us. So if you guys are one of my Patreon folks, please be patient. Thank you for all your support. And if you're new, fear not. We will find you good reasons to hang around. So uh, until next time, guys, I have been your wine shark. Cheers. All right, pizza. I'm going for pizza. Or I'm having pizza delivered.